didn't know really how to end the year, and uh, Louise spoke last week on just this um, whole ab- ability just to be able to, to rest in God and uh, not allow ourselves to fret. And uh, I came across a well-known text in Isaiah 9, which says, For unto us a child is born, for unto us a child is given. The government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. And then this word, that, or this little phrase that most people throw around but never really unpack is Prince of Peace. And then it goes on to say, of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. And so I realized that the birth of Jesus, what we are celebrating over the season, made it possible for us to truly live at peace with God. Without the birth of Jesus, there would not be the life of Jesus. There would not be the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And that's why we celebrate this amazing time by giving gifts because Jesus himself is an amazing gift. And what that, what that gift is, is that Jesus replaces our fear of death with eternal life, which is Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And as a result of that, we are at peace with God. God instills and Jesus instills peace within us that we start to become the peacemakers that he speaks about in Matthew chapter 5 when he gives the Sermon on the Mount. And then we are able to express the peace that's within us to those around us. We've had a crazy year. I think 2020 will go down in history for as long as those who are living live. We'll, we'll refer back to that crazy year that we had. And maybe it'll be longer than 2020. Who knows? But the fact is, is it has been a year unprecedented, certainly in our lifetime and possibly in the last century or two. My question to you this morning is, have you discovered the place of peace in the storm of 2020? 2020? You can answer. No, just kidding. The question is, is how do we find peace in the storm and the storms of life? We've obviously had the storm of 2020, but there are individual storms we are facing. And the question is, is how do we find this perfect peace or this peace or this place of peace in the storms of our lives? Well, it's quite easy. We go to the perfect example. His name is Jesus. And Jesus has just finished in Mark 4. It describes how he's just finishing. He's had a whole day of ministry. So we had a memorial here yesterday. I was up late last night preparing. I was up early this morning preparing. I only gave Rich my preach at Hopper 7 this morning. While my eyes are a little bit red, I've had a crazy week. So I I can imagine this is what Jesus felt like. A whole day ministering. And he gets to this place and he says, guys, get in the boat. We're going to go to the other side. Hey, Ryan, go and sell that development. I'm going to take you somewhere. Hey, Peter, put out that deal. Hey, Rich, go and do this. Hey, Paul, do this. And what happens is, is, hey, Gary, go plant a church. And you think, well, I'm in the perfect will of God. I'm doing all of what he wants to do. And guess what? A storm arises. It's a little confusing. How many of us feel like that? But I'm doing what God said I was, I'm supposed to be doing. God, if this is what it is, well, maybe you should go to Acts chapter 9 and you look at Paul, the apostle. He's blinded. He gets knocked off his horse. He's blinded. And, and Ananias is sent to him. And it's the most crazy scripture where Ananias, God says to him, go and tell Paul that I'm calling him to go and minister to the Gentiles. But there's actually this little phrase that says, and I'm going, go tell him how much he's going to suffer for my name. Imagine going for a job interview and somebody says, you're welcome, we're going to hire you, but actually you're going to suffer through this process. You want the job? And Paul says, yes, because being in the perfect will of God does not mean And even Jesus in the boat does not mean that there will not be a storm. Storms are going to come. The question is, how do we deal with them? It goes on, and this storm arises, and these are most of them are hardened fishermen, and they are scared because the boat is taking on water. And there's Jesus, and it says he's sleeping on a cushion. Now I don't know if this was crocheted by his mother or whatever, but he has Jesus in the middle of the storm having a little nap, and he's toasting. And the, the, the disciples are going, "Really, Jesus? Like?" Uh, I mean, uh, hold on a second. We, we're obeying you. The storm's coming. And let me, let's catch from there, from verse 38. It says, and this is the New King James Version. They said, they awoke him and they said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? So he gets up and you can imagine Jesus. Like, you know, like when you ask your kids to go do the dishes. 
that kind of posture. Anyway, he, he, he rises, he rebukes the wind, and he says, peace. He speaks peace into the storm. The storm stills. The wind ceases. There's a great calm. Now, they were, they were, really, they were afraid bef- while the storm was going, but now they're really afraid. You can see here, it says, he says to them, what are you fearful of? Why is it that you don't have any faith? And it says they feared exceedingly, and they said to one another, who is this that even the wind and the sea obey? The point is, is there's so much anxiety in our world with you know, vaccines, COVID-19, uh, business, uh, you know, economy, uh, you've got Ramaphosa, you've got old Ace on the other side, you've got Biden, you've got Trump, you've got, this world has gone absolutely crazy. Like we thought it was crazy before, now it's just a bunch of whatever. I can't use the superlatives that are in my, my head right now. We're hearing about mental health issues increasing and rising exponentially. And yet Jesus' plan is to take us into storms, but through the storms, and bring us to a place of peace. If we respond to his invitation, if we discover the one who is peace. You know, I was probably about 16 or 17, I think, still in high school. Scotty, my brother, who was on drums now, uh, had this girlfriend, and her dad had this, those little uh, uh, sailboats. I don't know what they are. I mean, they almost look like a, a, a bathtub, you know. What are they called? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, they're small little boats. You can, it's a two-man, two-seater. And uh, obviously sail, and you go. And I had a friend who had one as well, and we'd, we'd sailed around in Marensha. But up in Joburg, you don't get a lot of wind. So sometimes you you know, just to get going. But <clears throat> on this particular occasion, we were at the Boskop Dam. My dad and I are out. We had windsurfers, had a whole bunch of things. I think they even had a ski boat. I can't recall all of it. But what I do remember from this moment, because it was quite traumatic for me, and I, I'm a decent swimmer, so I'm not worried about falling into the water. But now what happens is, is this wind, the squall comes, the storm comes. And we saw it like kind, kind of coming and rising up, a typical Joburg or high-felt storm coming. And the winds were blowing like crazy. For those of the men who want <coughs> or men's camp or the kids right now, the kids and dad's camp, my, my tent literally folded over flat on the ground. That's what happened at 4.30 on, on, on Saturday afternoon before the rain then set in. But this was a similar type of thing. It, this, this wind just came up. And the waves were, I mean, it doesn't look big when I go like this, but when you're on the water, it's, the waves are breaking into the boat. The boat's filling up with water. We are about 200 meters from shore. And the wind is coming from the shore where we're supposed to be at us. Now, if you have anything to do with sailing, you can't sail into the wind. It's not possible because you go backwards. So my dad, thank goodness, was there, and he had a clear mind and stopped me panicking because I'm thinking, this boat's going under. Like the guy whose boat it is is actually realizing that his boat is probably going to go down to the bottom because here are two guys who don't know what they're doing. But thank goodness my dad kind of worked it out, and he's an engineer, and he tacked us back into shore. But I remember that was quite a traumatic moment for me because I thought, look, I can get out and jump and swim back to shore, but this boat's going down and uh, my dad's not going to let this thing go, so now I'm, I don't, I don't want to leave him, and etc., etc. The point that I'm trying to make is that Jesus is asleep in the middle of the storm, which shows that the peace that Jesus had is way deeper and bigger than the storm could ever be. Whatever you're going through, the peace that Jesus has can overshadow whatever you're feeling in the storm that you're in. That, that is an amazing thing to think about right now. Whether it's COVID-19, whether it's a death of somebody close to you, whether, and we did a memorial here yesterday. Stella de Chalane, just tragically killed 10 days ago, turning into work and some muppet speeding, bashes into her and she's gone. That could happen to each one of us tomorrow, to our spouse, to our kids, to our parents. We have a father-in-law who is struggling, and I'm sure he's listening online right now, with cancer. And it's, you know, we're saying, God, won't you intervene? Won't you come and, and, and speak your healing power? But what if God doesn't do that? What if that storm has its ultimate, how do we deal with that? How do we deal with the lost one? How do we deal with the loss of a business? How do we deal with the loss of a deal? How do we deal with these things in the storms of life? Well, Jesus tells us and Jesus shows us that his peace can overshadow all of that despite what we feel, despite of us going through things. You know, we lose peace because often the storm overshadows that. And maybe your storm is that you're under pressure at work or business 
Maybe it's the attack of the enemy and various things. Maybe your health or whatever it might be. Maybe you're actually living in compromise and sin, and that's why the storm is there. Because some storms God doesn't send our way. The enemy does. And we need to discern the difference between them. Maybe you feel like the disciples right now. Jesus, where are you? Don't you care? Maybe you fear the future. Maybe you fear the future for your kids. Maybe you feel out of control because the one thing that this season has shown us is humanity is not in control. You know what? It's okay to feel overwhelmed. It's okay to feel those things. But it's not okay to live in that fear. We are called to discover the pathway to the place of peace. The reality is what you can see with the disciples and with us too is when we give a hook for fear to hook onto, what it does is it erodes peace within us. And when peace erodes, then all our decision making, like I was in that boat thinking, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? I need to bail out of the ship. I need to do you know, <laughs> what Jonah did and just get off the ship because maybe God has sent this to take me out. Just kidding. That was a joke. Anyway. But the point is that what fear does is fear invades our faithless spaces. So what space in your life, in your mind, in your thoughts? See, some people can go through business problems without a problem. Just, they, do, they just got an ability to do that. Others can go through the, the death of someone close to them without a problem, but others can't. And there's spaces within our hearts that we haven't allowed God in, and what are those faithless places that you need to allow the peace of God to come in so that fear does not come in, so that peace gets eroded and leaks out of your heart. See, I trusted my dad. We are called to trust Jesus, and when we do that, faith gets injected, fear gets ejected, and peace comes. So, despite what's going on in this world, and boats are taking on water, we see it across, just go onto social media, just go into the news and you'll see that. We get to choose whether we respond in faith or we respond in fear. The disciples, yes, they woke up Jesus, but they responded in fear. And that's why he said, where is your faith? Why are you so fearful? But Jesus wants to lead us through that fear. He wants to inject faith into those faithless spaces so that peace will come. And if we don't wake Jesus up and we don't activate that place, did you notice there that Jesus needed to speak peace before stillness came? We need the peace of God to come to bring stillness to the rocking boats so that our boats that are taking on water are able to navigate to the shoreline. I'm trusting even right now and even those online that as I'm talking and as I go through a few points now to finish off and to finish off this year, can you believe it? 2020 is almost done. Is that peace will come into your circumstances, into your heart, into your family, into your past, and into your future as you make decisions to go into the future. And it's like navigating. It's like there's a place of peace. And you know, when you, when you look at the, the pirate movies and all that, and you've got the treasure maps, and you've got X marks the spot, and that's where the treasure is. Well, there's a treasure, and his name is Jesus. And how do we get to Jesus? How do we navigate through the disappointments and, and the anxiety and the fear of life to find Jesus in these moments? And I want to give a couple of points to help. We were in the, the Kauai when we went, uh, after we were married, we went overseas. And Kauai is one of the islands within the Hawaii setup. And they, they filmed Jurassic Park on it. So it's one of those really cool, like crazy tropical islands. And there's a, a place called the Pacific Canyon. And it's kind of like the Grand Canyon of the Pacific. And you've got to walk up and you've got to hike right up to this area. And it's a long hike. And there's lots of people moaning and some people like stopping and sitting and but when you get to the top and the clouds open up, it's the most magnificent view that you could ever imagine. It was a bit spoiled by us because we had these two American tourists who had come behind us. And when they got up there puffing and puffing, all I heard was, oh my God! And I was like, no, that is God. This is God's thing, you know? Um, and, and not once, but like 10 times. like, shut up, we're trying to enjoy the scenery. But that was an aside. But the point is, is that there's this spectacular, like when we navigate, when we hike up, when we choose to be intentional, when we choose to allow ourselves to take this journey to find this place of peace, it's not easy, but when we get there, it's well worth it. So, we need Jesus to speak peace into our hearts, to fill those faithless spaces with the peace that God has through the faith that only comes by Him. So let's have a look at five quick things. 
Number one, go and be with Jesus. John 14 tells us that. See, the disciples at this point, at this time of the scripture, they were anxious. Jesus is saying, hey, guys, I'm leaving soon. And they're going, whoa, no, no, you can't leave. You've only been with you for three years. Please, don't, don't talk about things like that. Jesus says, don't worry, I'm going to leave you, Holy Spirit, and he's the one who's going to speak to you and remind you of all the things that I've taught you. And then in verse 27, he says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. Do you notice that peace isn't just a feeling, but it's actually a gift that Jesus gives. So not only is Jesus the gift for us on Christmas of peace that gives us the ability to have peace with God, but actually he gives us peace as a gift. I think many of you go to Jesus, but you don't open the gift of peace that he has for you. Because you're caught up in how you can sort things out. And then there's this other text in Ephesians where it says, actually Jesus himself is our peace. If you are not with the one who is peace, how do you think you're going to find peace? So, secondly, depend on Jesus. 2 Corinthians 12 says, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest in me. Because when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Interestingly, that Paul understood that. You know, so many people say, oh, you just, Christianity, Jesus, that's a crutch for you. 100%. I'm there. Because I depend on Jesus. I've surrendered my life to Jesus. I lean on Jesus. I am dependent on Jesus. There is a divine dependency that I put on God because if I don't do that, I find that peace dissipates from my heart and fear rises. Because there are things in life that I cannot control. Many of us cannot control those things. But when we say, God, you've got me, and you work all things to the good of those who love you and accord according to your purposes, and I give myself into that, I've had probably the hardest five years of my life. And I go, God, seriously? I thought, I'm, I'm, I'm planted a church. You said plant a church. Why is it so difficult? I love what Louise said last, last week about Ella and her pregnancy with Ella, that she fought for Ella, that when Ella arrived, there was just a, a greater sweetness about it. There are things in your life I'm saying to you guys, keep fighting for because when God comes and gives you the promise that he spoke of, it'll be all the more sweeter. But here's Paul, the apostle, and he's saying it was only when he became comfortable in his weakness that God gave him the strength to overcome. If we think we're going to do this and we just don't lean on Jesus and we can do the and a plan, actually we need Jesus to come in and we need to lean on him for my family, for myself, for my future, and for everything that's going on in my life. Do you know that our greatest asset as Christians is to rely on Jesus? And when we rely on Jesus, peace comes because it's not our problem. Actually, Lord, you said, I know you don't remind him, but I'm reminding you. You said, boom, boom, boom. You said you would stop traffic out here on this road called Cedar Road because your presence is so thick here that people just want to come and be in your presence. Not because of Gary Bradshaw or Louise Bradshaw or because of Lifehouse Church, but because your presence is on this property. See, often we've lost peace because we've stopped, stopped activating that divine dependence. And what happens over time is we realize that we've lost control and fear rises, and then we start to make unhelpful decisions. Why do you think successful people take their own lives? Like these Hollywood guys, they've got everything in the world, and yet they don't have peace. Why? Because they don't depend on God. They're depending on their own resources, their own gifting. Isn't it interesting that when the Israelites arrive, or they're just about to arrive into their promised land that God spoke of, Moses says the following in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 17. He says, you may say to yourself, my power and strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms His covenant, which He swore to your ancestors and as I speak of today. If God gives Ryan that, 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 that uh, deal this afternoon or those deals that Peter's waiting for, etc., or, or Ian's waiting for, some of you are sitting here waiting for, if you sit back and say, sure, look what I did, that's the start of the end because you've now just depending on yourself and you think you're all great shakes and look, look what I did. And that allows the enemy to come in. When as we are linked in to the source of life and we depend on him, he gives us peace and fear does not come up. Why is it that some of the most wealthy people are the most fearful of losing their wealth? Why? Because they don't depend on God. 
Because what it is, is that, that rich man, that Jesus says, well, one thing you lack, go and sell all your possessions to the poor, and he went away sad. He couldn't do it. Why? Because his dependency was on his wealth and not on Jesus. I've seen so many people in my time of ministry that they've wanted a child, and they've prayed hard, and we've prayed with them for hours. Or maybe it's a, a, a business. They've been out of job for six months, nine months, a year, two years. We pray, and they get this amazing job, the, the job of their, their dreams, whatever it might be. And guess what happens? <laughs> don't see them anymore. They disappear from community. Why? Because they've got everything they want. They don't need to depend on God or the community that God has put in place for them to depend on. They just go, and, and then what happens? Five, six years later, you see them, and they certainly do not have peace because they no longer depend on God. Thirdly, ask Jesus, not the world. There's this text out of Philippians that says, do not be anxious about every, anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends our understanding. You can't, you can't process it in your head. You've just got a peace. And everyone goes, but Gary, why are you so peaceful? This is not good. No, it's not good, but the peace of God overshadows the storm that I find myself in. It transcends my understanding. It guards my heart against getting upset with God and upset with people. And it guards my mind in Christ Jesus. There's so much going on at the moment. I mean, like people are asking, my kids, COVID-19, what's happening in school? Uh, this happening? Oh, I hope this happens. I hope that doesn't happen. And you know what? Worry really works because 99% of the things we worry about don't happen. But we allow ourselves to get into the what if. What if? You can imagine this disciples. What if? When I was in that boat with my dad, what if this thing goes down? And you focus on that and you become paralyzed by it that you actually don't do anything. What can you change? What can you do in the moment when the storm hits? You can wake up Jesus. Not that Jesus is asleep, but the disciples came to Jesus and they asked him. We have a Jesus that we can come to and we can ask the question, the enemy wants to distract our hearts to the what if. What if this happens? What if COVID, the second wave comes and it just takes over? What if we lose half our population? What if, what if, what if? What if the next Muppet who takes over our country just destroys it like a Robert Mugabe? What if America this? What if this? What if that? Who are we trusting in? Where do we get our peace from? See, once fear is there, peace disappears. And the one thing we can do is Jesus says in James 4 verse 2, you have not because you ask not. How many of you have actually gone to God and gone, Lord, my business, or Lord, my, my child, or Lord, the, the, Lord, we want you to intervene. We want you to come and speak your peace into the storm. And then Jesus gets up and speaks his peace and whew, overshadows the storm that we're in. You know, many of us don't go to God. We run across to our smartphones, and the iPhone 12's out. So come on, you've got to upgrade. I mean, you can't stay with the old phone. So, we, well, I need to find something. Now look, it's, it's, it's a brilliant use to this. I mean, as you guys know, I've gone back into the corporate world, and there's some things that people say, can you do this? And I go, I think so. What do I do? Google. Google's my friend. I've created the most unbelievable timelines, Gantt charts, why? Because you just go onto YouTube and you follow the instructions and you go into Excel and you follow it. It's actually quite easy. You can find whatever you want on the internet. But you know what we do? Is we substitute that and instead of going to ask Jesus, we go to the internet. Google's your friend, not Jesus. But I thought Jesus said he's become your friend. And he's there. Do you know that we look at our phones and we, we look for information on our phones on average 150 times a day? One out of two people have their phones next to their bed because they don't want to miss out on something that may be communicated through social media or something. And it's the first thing that we look at in the morning, isn't it? Have I got any emails? I wonder if we went to Jesus 150 times a day. What do you think, Lord? I need to ask you, Jesus, to intervene. Lord, I need your peace. You are the one who is peace. I want to spend time with you and be with you so that your peace will come and inject so that it will take me to a place that will overshadow and overcome the fear and anxiety that I feel right now. 
The disciples woke him up. And Jesus himself said in Mark 11, Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer and believe, you will receive and it will be yours. Whatever. Whatever. We are called to go to Jesus in thanksgiving, present our requests and our petitions before him. And when we do that, and when we engage him in faith, not like fear like the disciples, what happens? Peace comes. Transcends our understanding. Second, lastly, live in peace with yourself and with others. Hebrews 14, 12, 14 says, make every effort. <laughs> it's not like, well, just kind of let it happen. No, make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God so that no bitter root may grow up and cause trouble and defile many. It's interesting, isn't it? Just, just put a piece of rotten meat into your fridge. Guess what will happen? But we think it's okay to hold unforgiveness in our hearts towards others and even for ourselves. We don't allow the forgiveness of God to come in and to wash away and make us clean. And so what's key here is repentance and forgiveness. I, I don't know about you, but I've had many people hurt me. I'm sure you, every single person here online, we've all been hurt by somebody. And normally it's the people closest to us. And I'm sure you've hurt people, because I've hurt people. Most times unintentionally, sometimes intentionally. But we've all been hurt, and we've all hurt. And God's called us to a place of forgiveness and repentance, because that's another pathway to find the place of peace. And in the person of Jesus, who is peace. So many people struggle to find themselves and find their future because they are stuck in their past. I love Rich's comment. It's a prison of resentment. You know, bitterness. Go read in Ephesians 4. It turns out to become all kinds of malice if you don't deal with it. I love what Alexander Fenter says. If you don't deal with bitterness now when you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, when you get to 70 and 80, you become omgekrap. For those who don't know Afrikaans, you get raked over backwards. It's not a pleasant sight for the people around you because you are unpleasant to be around. Because everything, you're a victim and you just hurt people around you by your words and the way that you act. May we not be an omgekrap people. But you know what peace does? It provides a foundation for us to dream again. What are you dreaming of? Have you stopped dreaming? COVID-19, oh, let's shut the, you know, shut the front door. No. Let's open the front door and let's start to dream about what God wants to do that when the opportunity comes, we are able to take advantage of what God has said. Please don't sit back and go, let's just wait for this thing. No, what are you preparing yourself for? Some of you who, who can't go to work or whatever the case is, well, are you studying for what God has called you to? Are you preparing yourself for the moment when the opportunity comes, you can take advantage of it? Or do you go, oh, I should have. Oh, I should have learned how to play guitar. Because I want to be in the worship team. You've had the most unbelievable opportunity right now. Oh, I should have studied this. Well, go study it. So when the opportunity comes, you can jump into it. See, bitterness and resentment, <clears throat> the picture I had was like navigating a narrow mountain pass on a misty night. Guess what's going to happen? At some point, you're going to lose yourself off the road and come tumbling down. And lastly, and very shortly, be still. Now, if you remember, about 20 minutes ago, I said you have to have peace before you get stillness. Jesus spoke peace and then stillness came. But be still and know that I'm God. You have to still yourself to access peace. If you go into the presence of Jesus, okay, thanks, Lord, I'm out of here. Well, you kind of leave the gift of peace with him. But when you go in, and silence and solitude is the most unbelievable pathway that leads us to the place of peace. Because we take the noise that's in our heads and our hearts and we move away from the noise of people and what they're saying and we presence ourselves with Jesus and peace gets spoken into our heart and we unwrap the gift of peace that he has for us. Silence and solitude is a great tool where we find Jesus, where we depend and we surrender to him and his lordship, where we allow him to speak peace into our lives and where we are empowered to live out the peace for ourselves and for one another. 2,000 years ago, we were given the most unbelievable ultimate gift, and his name is Jesus. He gives us the gift of peace. How many of us are going to unwrap it over this time? 
to set ourselves up for 2021. I want to encourage you, unwrap that gift. And you know what? It's a gift that keeps on giving. You can keep going back to it and opening it up and it gets bigger and it pervades more of your heart and it goes into those faithless spaces and it ejects fear and allows the peace of God to rise up so that we can dream again and that we can navigate what's ever in front of us. I know I could speak a lot more into this. I could bring community into it. I could bring a whole bunch of things. But I felt that those five things, if we can take a hold of over the season, I think it sets us up that as we move into a new year, and we all know that on the 31st when it clicks over, it's not like you go and you feel this bump and you're into a new kind of dimension. I really hate Marvel and DC, the way they've done these parallel universes. You get so confused. Which Batman's that? I mean, Batman used to be Batman. Now it's Batman, this universe, that universe. I get confused. My imagination is maybe not that big. But we have one parallel universe. It's called the kingdom of God. And it is broken here and broken on planet Project Earth. And Holy Spirit is part of us. And where heaven meets earth is part of us. Let's be the portals of Holy Spirit and where heaven meets earth and the temples of God to go out into the byways and highways of life over the season to bring about the peace that God injects within us. This world needs peace. Let's be the peace that Jesus gives us and be the gift that Jesus has given us to others. Won't you stand, please? So Paul, Paul's just got this... Uh, song that we'll sing in a moment but let me pray for you first and then we'll move into the the song that he's got and then i'll hand back over to rich so father i thank you that you gave us jesus that for unto us a child is born unto us a child is given that he is the prince of peace and that the government and his peace will have no end i thank you lord that there is no end to your peace and that you came to project planet earth as a baby, and you brought, made it possible for us to be reconciled with the Father once more, with the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I pray right now that we would be a people that would open up that gift of peace, that we would spend time with you, that we would depend on you, Lord, that we would be a people, Lord, who still ourselves and allow, God, your peace to come and inject into those faithless spaces, that fear would have no hooks. And that, God, we would make good decisions going forward because we would dream again and we would hear your voice and your promises despite the fact that there's a storm out there that your peace will pervade and overshadow the storms in our lives. Lord, we want to be the peacemakers you spoke of, but we know we need your peace and we know that only, we only get that by being with you. And so, Lord Jesus, we give ourselves and we, we step off the thrones of our hearts once more. We keep climbing back on. It's like kids climbing onto a balcony. But Lord, we step off and we give you the driver's seat. Take the steering wheel. And thank you that you are our Savior, but we, we declare that you are our Lord. And we step into that divine dependency again. And we say, let your peace come and guard our hearts and minds. And take us into your preferred future for us, despite the storms around us. In Jesus' name.